How many of you guys uh, run cranes now, currently? Any operators? Three guys? Climbers? Ground guys? Yes! Yes. Um, I, I put this program together uh, uh, two years ago because I was like, you know what? Like, we always talk about the operator. We always talk about the climber, all oh, the cl crane climber, cr you know, crane operator. But what about the guys, the glue, right? The guys that really hold it down is the, the guys on the ground. So, um, you know, some of this stuff that I'm going to be going over is stuff that we typically teach crane operators. Um, but to be honest, you know, you guys, you, you're part of the team too. And as an operator, a lot of times we're in a cab and we're fixed in a place. There's things that we can't see. You guys need to know what to look for when it comes to working around a crane. And that way, when something looks wrong, you could say, hey, let's, let's take a look at this before we move on. All right, you have an opinion too when you're on the job. You're part of the team. You should know what it takes to take trees down with cranes. And that's the bottom line. So this class is for you guys, my groundies, all right? Because everybody here at one point started as a groundie and worked their way up, all right? So be proud of what you do. And like I said, you're, you know, if you're working your way up in the ladder, keep doing it, all right? All right, let's get started. So um, like I said, we're gonna be talking about key factors for ground personnel and crane use. Um, and if, like I said, if you guys don't know who I am, I'm Hans Thielman. I'm the founder and owner of New Jersey Crane Expert. I'm also the founder and, o founder and, o and owner of Noble Oak uh, Safety and Training. Hey, Hans, uh, I'm sorry, I'm about to roll the wheelchair in here. Can y'all make the hole real quick? Yeah. Welcome. I got a spot for you right here. <laughs> right in the front. All right. VIP. All right, cool. Make sure you can see the screen. All right. Thanks, sir. Yeah, if anybody wants, there's room. If anybody wants to come in and sit down in the, on the floor, come on in. I think, I don't know if anybody sit. There's some seats in the back. Got seats. Yeah, squeeze in, man. We might need a bigger place next year. You know, I don't know if you guys heard, but we um, last year we had 700 registrations. This year we had 1,100. So we're up about 40% in attendance this year. So I'm, like I said, I'm happy you guys are here. You know, trick guys are inconsistent. There's going to be a bunch that just show up and register tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be cool. <laughs> so whatever. Like I said, we adapt, right? We're adapters. We're, we're, we, we're, so, we're solutions people. You got a problem, we'll come up with a solution for it. All right, especially when it comes to tree work. All right, so again, um, I'm a mobile crane master trainer. I'm nationally accredited by NCCR, uh, subject matter expert. I'm also a New Jersey licensed tree expert in the state of New Jersey. So I do a lot of expert witnessing in the state of New Jersey as it relates to trees and how we use cranes and trees. And whenever there's accidents or um, issues when it comes to equipment, um, people bring me in as an expert to kind of figure out what happened. Um, I'm also a TCI CTSP. Um, and if you guys don't follow me on Instagram, uh, my Instagram is the Bad Hans, okay? And you can also follow our company, NJ Crane Expert, on Instagram, all right? Been doing it my whole life. I started doing tree work when I was two years old, worked my way up the, up the ladder, um, but I was a groundy up until I was probably 17, 18 years old before I started hopping in the tree. And to be honest, my whole life, my parents never wanted me to do this work because of how dangerous it is. And that's one of the big motivators for me to why I like to teach is because you know what? I don't want people to say, I don't want my kids to do this. I wanna say, here's solutions to reduce those risks because this is a great industry to be in. I don't want people to be scared to be an arborist. And that's why I like to teach. Um, so I've been doing it a pretty long time. Um, I got a name for myself in the industry back in 2012 during Hurricane Sandy for my approach to safety in, in hazardous situations uh, doing storm work. Um, got nat recognized by TCIA. They had me come in and do some work with them and kind of blew up on Instagram and social media. Um, in 2015, I was the top five most recognized arborists in the world. So today, my section objective, again, I'm not just gonna spew information at you. I want you guys to walk out of here with something, all right? And again, we're only, we only have so much time together, but I want 
to make sure that you guys walk away with some core principles, all right? So the core principles, today we're gonna walk away from this session with the core principles of what to think about, what to consider as a ground worker when we're incorporating cranes on the job. All right, so first let's get some formal stuff out of the way. All right, everybody has their role on the job site. Has any of you guys ever had an issue and had to deal with OSHA before? You guys ever had OSHA come on the job? Never heard of her. Never heard of her? <laughs> I have. So whenever it comes to formalities, everybody on the job has to have a role. Um, you guys have, at your companies, you guys have company safety policies, you guys have employee handbooks. Well, in those handbooks, it should, they should be able to lay out and your duties and responsibilities and your job. You're not just a tree worker. You have a position in the, biz, in the company. And with that position, you have responsibilities. So on the job, when we're dealing with cranes, we have a crane operator. We have an arborist aloft, which is just a fancy word, a way of saying climber. Okay. Then we have our qualified arborist in charge, which is our foreman. Okay. That should be somebody that has the most amount of knowledge and experience to make those decisions on the job. Then we have our ground worker, and then we have our qualified signal person. Our qualified signal person could be anybody on the job. It has to be somebody that's been, that has been educated and tested and competent in rigging and signaling. Okay? A lot of times the qualified signal person is also the climber. All right, so now that we went over everybody's roles, all right, let's talk about site safety. All right, so we have to do a site assessment. We have to do a crew walkthrough. We have to identify hazards, and we have to include all that information onto a job briefing. Do any of you guys currently do a job briefing every day for every job? OK, well, at least you do something, OK? <laughs> and I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy to see some hands, all right? Because again, last year, I, I trained 700, just under 750 people last year. And when I ask that question, I usually get about 10%. So out of the 750 people, maybe 75 people put their hands up when I ask that question. All right, so the paperwork is one of those things that a lot of tree guys don't do. All right, and that's because they're like, well, I'm a tree guy, I know how to do trees. I don't know how to do all the formal stuff. All right, but this is something that you have to do every day. And for the most part, we do most of this except for this. Right? You get to the job and either the foreman or the salesperson or the owner walks you around and says, all right, we're cutting this tree down. We're going to back the truck in here. Watch out for the wires. Watch out for the well. Watch out for grandma's grinding stone in the garden. You know, Don't break that. Move this. That's your site assessment. You just did it. Now write it down. Okay? And that's all it is. It's just writing all that down. Now you just did your job briefing. Now there's a little bit more information that's gonna be included there, but that's the gist of it. So when I say who does it, you, most of you guys do something like that. You don't just show up and say, I don't know what I'm doing here. In that form, would like video documentation suffice if you needed that for issue, if you had that file, if you say of doing it digitally? Yes, it would be, yes. If you have any sort of proof that, what we're doing is we're identifying legally that there was a plan in place, that we had a plan for the work, all right? Instead of having to write down, because I suck at writing, I can walk, what I typically do is when we're doing the thing, we walk it, talk it, and then it's on the video, so if I have a problem, I can refer back to that. You can do that. There are some things that you might miss formally. Um, we actually just, my, if you go stop at our booth, we just actually just came out with, our, with an app that you literally can walk around and just check boxes off on your phone. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And then it saves, it saves in your phone if there's an incident, you pull up the date, pull up the address, and it's all there. So, because again, paperwork is like, uh, it's, not, it's not exciting, but something you have to do, all right? And when OSHA shows up, um, there's three reasons why OSHA shows up to your job. One, um, oh my God, I'm brain farting right now. Um, one is gonna be that you had an accident, okay? Some a fatality or there's an injury. Um, the second one, oh my God. Um, the second one is gonna be that you have your crane up in the air and they're driving by, okay? Hey, I'm over here, right? Here's my crane. They're on their way to a nursing home, to pinch a nursing home, and now they see you. Let me stop here real quick and see what's going on, number two. Third reason why OSHA shows up, rats. Somebody rats you out, okay? And it's most likely a competitor of yours, okay? It's grimy up there in the Northeast, bro. Listen. <laughs> it is, man. When you're in an area where there's 2,000 tree services in, you know, a small area. And I, and I 
Yeah. yeah. They'll say, hey, go check out so and so on on you know Church Street. They're not wearing helmets. They're then OSHA shows up. Yeah. And every area has a territory, OSHA territory. So there's usually somebody within 30 minutes of wherever you're working. Okay. So again, and when they show up, the first thing they ask is, where's your briefing? Show me your plan. Show me what's going on here. Okay. And who's the first person they talk to when they show up on a job? The fucking guy in the robe raking. <laughs> all right. And if, TikTok, right? All right. Who's on? Yeah. Who's, you know, and they say, hey, what's going on here? Okay. Hey, what's going on here? And you say, I don't know. Go talk to him. That's a ticket. Yep. Okay. Oh, you should say, hey, I'm a, I'm a ground guy. I'm chipping up brush right now. We're taking down these four trees, but if you need anything else, you can go talk to my boss over there. And now you've delegated your responsibility. You've, you've, your you've explained your role, what you're doing there, what the work is, move on, okay? The, we would, we, what we ultimately want is to get them to leave, right? So you give them what they want, they go, they go on. They, have, they already have a schedule that day. They just are stopping. Like I said, if they're, if they're doing a drive-by, they're just stopping to, to see if everything is kosher. All right, and then they're moving on. They got that nursing home to pinch. All right, it's truth. All right, so a site assessment must be performed first and before any crane operations are going to begin. So again, that's the other thing, is that we show up with the crane. All right, the crane's here. Let's get the crane in the driveway. Let's get the crane in the back. Everybody's running around. All right, you got to do your paperwork first. Okay. Qualified arborist in charge must carefully examine, evaluate, and document both the job site and the trees being removed to determine what hazards are going to be present in the trees and around them. A written work plan for the crane use must be completed and reviewed with every person on the job. And that's the other thing about paperwork. On your job briefing, it has everybody who's going to be there. Every member on your crew has to print and sign and date that they were there. That proves that you went over the work plan with them. All right? Yes. OK? Everyone should participate during the walkthrough, right? We do that. We do a walkthrough every day, every job. All right? And the operator is going to, and, and what that does is it, is it helps the operator or the crew identify anything we missed, right? If the operator goes and does a, a site walk without you, you might see something that they missed. OK? So making sure everybody's involved is very important. Ground guys, right? A lot of times, like, oh, the ground guy, he doesn't know anything. But we got two sets of eyes, right? We can see things. It's you just have to know what to see. All right, so what are we going to look through during a walkthrough? All right, the first thing we're going to do is we're going identify to our, identify our zones. All right, so every job is going to have different zones. We're going to have a crane zone where we're setting up our crane. We're going to have a landing zone. Once we make the pick, where is it landing? Okay. Then we're going to have our drop zone. Our drop zone is going to be around the tree that we're taking down. If a branch breaks out, something falls, um, you know, we want to make sure there's nobody in that area, in that drop zone. And then we're going to have our chipper, um, chipper or debris truck zone. All right? Sometimes our landing zone isn't where the chipper is. Sometimes it has to be moved. And that's the other thing is like identifying those zones. Because sometimes crane guys get in trouble because they, bring, they take this big pick, all right? and they're like, oof. That was freaking awesome. I just made this big pick. And then they bring it over, and the groundy goes, OK, let's go bring it, put it on the deck of the chipper. <laughs> and now they go past their, their radius, overextend themselves, and then they lose stability and flip over, because they went way too far trying to put it in the chipper. All right, so sometimes our landing zone isn't going to be the same area as our chipper. All right, you got to get the mini. You got to get something to pull it the rest of the way. Make sense? All right. Then we have to identify how much space do we need. So in Jersey, we have problems with wires. We have to sometimes having the biggest crane in the world don't matter because we can't take more than a limb or two because we can't put it anywhere, you know, depending on the yard size. So making sure that we take the time to think how much space do we need to manipulate the load. Sometimes you bring it down, you got to spin it around, you got to put it in a certain spot, uh, making sure that we think about on the ground, hey, how much room do we need? Sometimes the crane is in the spot where we need to bring the piece down. The crane needs to be moved over so we have room to bring stuff, bring stuff to the ground. Then equipment maneuverability. You know, if we have a giant or a loader or a mini, you know, how much room do we need to grab that piece and manipulate it with a piece of equipment? So again, this is all stuff that ground guys have to think about. 
all right? Access for trailers, so again, depending on where you are, if you guys do jump trailers, log loaders, whatever, making sure we have sufficient room for that, or have a plan to say, hey, at this time, we're gonna swap trucks out, bring the loader in here, stage the, stage the log, stage the material, and then load it later, at a later time. This is all stuff you guys have to think about. All right, as far as site inspection hazards, we're gonna be looking for changes in terrain. So I don't know where you, you know, I mean, out here in Asheville, man, the freaking hills is go like this. You know, changes in grade um, and terrain, um, that's a hazard, especially if you're working on a, you know, I've worked on jobs where, you know, we're walking up and down hills, my toes, my feet, my ankles, everything hurts. Sometimes we're walking on embankments sideways. We have to always be careful about, about walking on, on level ground. Um, so making sure that that's important. Slip trip areas, if it's really wet out, um, we don't want to slip and slide and hurt ourselves. Um, we also have to look for septic systems. You guys have septic systems around here? All right, so like out by us, we have sewer, but you know, depending on the customer, sometimes you get somebody with a cesspool or a septic system or a dry well, and um, a lot of times the homeowner don't even know what they have. We've done jobs where we showed up, they're like, oh, we're sewer, and we're driving across their septic field. Great. Awesome. You know? Yeah, you know? Um, and then utilities, over and underground utilities, you know, making sure that, you know, we have minimum, minimum clearance when it comes to setting up the crane. All right. Um, next we're going to have, um, we're going to look for certain types of targets. Let me see. Um, so there's two types of, there's two types of targets that we're going to be, whoops. There's two types of targets that we have to consider. We have hard targets and soft targets. Hard targets are things that we're gonna encounter on the job that we can't move. A greenhouse that we're taking down a dead tree over, we can't move that. So we have to be careful to work around that. You know, a garage, a shed, a fence. I mean, a fence you can take down. We've taken some fences apart. Um, a deck, walkways, special patios. That's all stuff that is delicate. And if you damage it, it costs money to fix. Those are called hard targets. All right, AC units, yeah, all right? Then we got soft targets. These, these are targets that we have to be aware of but should be moved, okay? Cars, patio furniture, grill, landscape decor. Like I said, we've been on, we've been on jobs where so-and-so's grandma brought the bird bath back from Italy. It's not replaceable. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an heirloom. You don't want to break that. That's not a happy customer, all right? So that's all stuff that you gotta, you have to take into consideration as a groundie. Hey, clear this stuff, anything that can be damaged. Even like the little like landscape flags, the stupid little things that are this tall, pull them out of the ground, put them back later. That's all stuff that people complain about. When you did a great job, I'm like, oh, you broke my flag. <laughs> now, now you don't get that Google review. You don't, you get there like, I want $100 for it. You know, that's what I'm saying. And that's all the ground guys. So you gotta make sure, every, prep the site, all right? We're gonna move all our soft targets. We're gonna, you know, sometimes we'll take plywood, we'll lean plywood over things to make sure if anything hits, it'll bounce off. Anything that can be moved is important. And then identify, do we need to bring mats in? You know, I've been on jobs where they're like, F the lawn, we don't care. Drive whatever you want. And then there's people like, no, my lawn is my baby and we don't wanna see a single blade of grass bent, you know? Um, so identifying, do we need to bring mats? Do we need to have mats on this job? All right, now we're gonna talk about, we're gonna, we're gonna identify any hazards as it relates to the crane. Okay, so now we went over our site prep and hazards that are related to the property. Now we want you to understand that there's gonna be certain things that we need to be aware of as ground guys when working around the crane. All right, first thing's gonna be making contact with utility lines. On the ground guys, you are the eyes of the crane operator when it comes to how close am I to those wires? Well. It looks like you're about 20 feet away. You're the ground guy, that's your job. Your, your job is to be like, all right, hey, stop. Can't get any closer. Minimum approach is gonna be 10 feet, okay? So you do not want that crane any closer than 10 feet. And I've had OSHA people send in pictures of competitors saying, hey, look how close this crane was to those wires, all right? So making sure, hey, you as a ground guy, you're gonna be the one to say, hey, don't, don't swing anymore. You're getting close to those wires, all right? Then we gotta be careful with unstable setup, yeah. right? The cranes, cranes, you know, by design, 
they're based on two specific uh, factors. It's going to be structural strength and stability. All right. The crane has to be structurally sound to be able to make the lift and not break. And the crane has to be set up properly so it does not flip. All right. If our ground is unstable, we're going to flip over. Okay. Yeah. Come on in, guys. Yeah. You want to come in? There's you guys sit on the floor. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, all right. So setup, mechanical failure. So again, uh, making sure the machine is structurally sound. Now, I don't think that that's a responsibility of the of a ground guy to do. But again, as you're as the machine is running and you start to see a leak, you say, hey. So let's stop for a second, take a look at this. There's something leaking, something bent, stuff hits the crane sometimes. You know, let's make sure that, you know, as the ground guys, you look for mechanical failures, you know, things that could potentially be a good day turn to a catastrophic failure. All right. Next is going to be tight spaces. All right. And not only do we have to be concerned with damaging things, but what about our bodies? You know, I've been in situations where we've taken crane picks. I'm making flush cuts. We're pulling stems out of people's, the corners of their houses. I need to be able to have an exit route, all right? Because right? again, a lot of times the ground is the guy's making the flush cut on the stump, all right, on the last pick. So can I get out of there? Can I escape? So making sure we're aware that tight spaces, you don't want to get pinched in between something, all right? And we also don't want to damage the house. We also don't want to damage personal property or damage the machine. Because right? if you're booming up too tall, you're rate your cable up too high, you're going to hit something. You're going to break something or snap something. And then finally, it's going to be improper rigging. So from the ground, is, it, is, that, is that choked properly? All right? These are all things, as a ground person, you should be aware of. And again, like I said, we are, as groundies, we're catch-alls. You've got to know a little bit about everything. Right? You've got to have this magic ball that's like, hey, this can happen. You have the spidey sense. All right. So here's our ground worker checklist. So if you guys are going to take any pictures, this is what I want you to take a picture of. All right. So these are the concepts that we're going to be covering now. All right. So again, we went over job site safety. We went over hazards. Um, we'll talk a little bit about ground conditions and get into, get into all the other good stuff. All right. So the way that, the way that I, when I got into, I got into crane work way after I was a groundie, but as an operator, I started to think to myself, I need to put together a list of things that I need to know and putting together a list of like this. So there, most of this stuff is the same stuff that we would teach a crane operator. Um, because if one of these, if you were to miss one of these criteria, that's when you have problems, All right? But if you're auditing yourself while you're working, you're saying, I'm good, check, 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 check. There's nothing to worry about. You're going to have a sweet day, OK? But if you miss one, one miss could be a big problem. All right, so we went over the foundational principles, all right, structural strength and stability. All right, so those are the two, the two biggest things when it comes to using a crane and working around a crane. All right, will it break or will it flip? All right. Uh, says yes. What? TikTok says yes. TikTok says yes. Um, next thing that we need to be aware of is what type of soil, what type of soil, what type of surface are we setting up on? Okay. I'm um, gonna tell you guys something. Growing up, you know where I grew up? I was in Jersey, but I grew up in a swamp. Okay. I lived in a swamp until I was 14. I didn't have cable until I was 14. All right. And uh, that was rough back in the day. We'd go to school and be like, oh, did you see Nickelodeon last night? And I'd be like, nah, dude, I got Channel 13 and that's it. Oh, bro, twist, twist, ours was 33. I can get the Simpsons sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. So I was always outside working. Um, but growing up, well, once we moved, but, but our business, we still worked in the swamp. So when I, when I grew up and I was still doing crane work, we were working in the swamp and we were setting up in marshes and we're setting up on stuff that we have 11 PSI where I, if I walk on it, I'm sinking. You know, my feet are sinking down. Now I got to set a crane up here. How am I going to do that? All right. Uh, so had under, uh, had that happen. They were pumping concrete with a pump truck. Yeah. And they had wet clay, and it was they were bringing it in. They overextended, and there was none of this happened on that job site. They didn't have a plan. They didn't have anything. Outrigger failed into the clay, and the boom did what it would do with that. And the only guy that noticed it went the same way as the crane op went, and it landed right on. He popped him right on the head and killed him. 
And that happened like they were out there pumping concrete at five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. They may never went home because of it's terrible. Because it's terrible. Home. Yeah. So understand, like I said, so understand what type of soil, what type of soil are we working with? All right. And understanding, you know, depending on what we have, you know, it's going to have a certain PSI. PSI stands for pounds per square inch. So for every square inch of soil that we're setting up on, on undisturbed lawn, it's good for 22 pounds. Okay, so how many inches do we need to hold up 80,000, 100,000 pounds of force and pressure? All right, because it's a battle when it comes to stability. How much can the earth hold up compared to how much we're putting down on it? Okay, and the way that we... The way that we, we, we strategize is that is the bigger the surface that we're setting up on, the more pressure is dispersed over that surface. And that's why I'm such a fanatic when it comes to pads, all right? Because growing up, we didn't have the biggest crane in town, but I set my crane up like it was the biggest crane in town. Because for me, as an operator, I said, you know what? There's only so much I have control of from the ground but I have control over how I set my machine up and how I position it. I might not be able to make the cuts for the climber, but I know that my setup is sweet and I won't have any problems, all right? And that just took five more minutes. That took five more minutes of thought and effort. And then once you're up there, you're like, man, this is good. We're solid, we feel good, okay? It takes only a couple of minutes. Um, I, I don't have time to go over how to calculate this stuff, but. It, know that there is a formula for that, okay? But even like something like this, okay? These are, um, these are welded beams, steel beams that are welded together to make a four by eight pad that they set this massive crane up on and it still failed, okay? Um, they were, you know, a lot of people are like, well, how can you prevent this? They obviously they are like, you know, in something like this, this size pad is good for probably close to 400,000 pounds of pressure and it still collapsed. And the question that I said was, well, there was a sign that something could have been wrong and the sign is this utility mark out right here. There's something here. So there might have been an issue here and then water got in there and could have eroded that soil underneath there causing it to create a void. So knowing this, I would have said, eh, there's something under the ground here. I don't know what it is, let's back up. Let's set up 10 feet further away. Okay, so again, who's looking for stuff like that? The ground guys. Would you choose to go forward? Either way, either way, as long as I'm not near this. When you're out here, right? Yep. Okay. How about this? Does this look yeah. look safe? Yeah. It's got the smoke. It's on the light side. <laughs> How's that look? I think I would have done some. I think I would have done a little bit different. All right. Okay. So, um, so a couple of things is that when it comes to pressure um, and cranes, we always want to make sure that whatever surface we're setting up on, even though the grade may be changing, our surface of pressure is level. So wherever the pad meets the, the stabilizer foot or outrigger plate meets the pads, we want that we want that to be a flat surface. Okay, level. Uh, perpendicular to the, the, the downward pressure. Um, and for that, because of the reason of how, how pressure works is that something like this, um, when we do calculate how much this pad is gonna be put, put down on the ground, we're utilizing, remember we're talking about PSI, how many inches? And when it's on, a, when it's on an angle like this, what happens is, is the downward side of the, of the, of the setup gets, experiences more pressure. It's just like if you were to go hiking, what's the hardest part about going hiking up a hill? It's going back down, okay? Because our, our feet, our toes are experiencing more pressure in the front than it would be on our heels, okay? So we always wanna make sure that if we're setting up on, on, on level, I would shim this and then have another, another surface above that, pressing that, that down evenly. Okay, what, what other alternatives could we do here to make this setup look a little bit better? You could dig out a little bit. Yeah. You could dig it out, right? You could take a shovel, right? We're not afraid to work, right? We're tree guys. Get that spade out and start freaking digging, okay? So what happened here, I don't have a picture of it, but because this was set up the way it was, this stabilizer actually started to slide downhill, okay? And if you looked at the beam, the horizontal beam, it started to warp because it was sliding down the hill. 
Now what? Now we're putting we're compromising the integrity of our of our system. All right, we're structurally compromising our outrigger system. How about this one? All right. Actually, that was a question I was going to ask. You had a chart of all the different things. I mean, would setting up on wood chips would that have the same PSI as undisturbed? A hundred percent, no. This is like setting up on a sponge. So, so, so this is a situation where you would want to dig that out. You would want to dig out the, yep, until you get to something. Because again, what else hides under, under mulch? Sprinklers, right, irrigation stuff, stumps, old stumps. They cover landscaper, throws some mulch over the old stump, right? We don't want to set up on that, okay? So, um, but this is a good example um, that, or which I call the tacoing effect. All right, where you experience so much force in the center of the pads where they start to taco. And again, if we're if we're if we're, we're if we're relying on every square inch of that pad to, to hold its own weight, the ground can't can't support only the weight of the center of that pad. It has to be able to use, utilize all of it. So you would either a have to have a thicker pad, or you'd have to have a bigger pad with a more a solid a bigger supportive surface above that. Because again. This float plate right here, this foot is only eight inches. So we're going from eight inches of pressure to 24, all right? So it's forcing in the middle. If you pyramid it, then it, it, each level that goes down supports it a little bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, all right? So I'm a, I'm a big advocate that the pads that come with our cranes are not sufficient to do the work that we do. If we were in the concrete business, if we were working in the cities, we're setting up on, you know, Tarmax. Sure, these pads are great, but not for tree work, not for setting up on lawns. And a lot of guys buy cranes, they buy knuckle booms, and they say, oh, it came with pads. That's all I need. That is not all you need, all right? We are, we are the type of people as an industry where we like things done a certain way, and we're not afraid to do things beyond what's required. We're not minimum people. We don't do things to the minimum. We go beyond. The good ones go beyond. So for me, this is not... This is not close to being adequate. All right, how about these? All right, broke the sidewalk, punched through. All right, punched through right there. All right, and again, again, they say, oh, well, this is what it came with. That must be good enough. We're not good enough. We don't do good enough. We do right, okay? All right, so again, here's your bearing surface. Again, and what, what our job is, is to be able to transition this pressure down onto this. Now, if this was a steel plate, that's not going to bend, all right, unless you're putting really excessive amounts of weight on it. But we're, we're, dealing, with, we're dealing with composite material, all right? So you, you don't disperse this evenly. You're not going to get pressure on these outside edges, which we're calculating for, for that PSI. So this is my setup. This is how I do it. Um, I love wood. I'm an old school dude, so we used to just use all wood. That's why you like make stuff out there in total. But now, yeah, with the wood prices, you know, it's like it costs just as much for the wood as the pads, you know. Um, so I always set up my crane. I always set up my crane with a minimum of a 32 by 48 sheet, two sheets of plywood, which is a third of a sheet of a plywood, doubled up, and then I would put these two. Before I got these pads, I would put two. 16 by two laminated beams on top. That gives me a nice almost four inch surface, you know, stacked up. And the reason why I do this is because rather than having a big bolted mat together, this is easy to do by yourself. You just take, you just go make a couple trips, put them all together, all right? It's manageable. Um, and then for this, I do the same sheets of plywood and now I have a 30 inch pad with a 24 inch pad on top of that. And that is able to, because again, if I were to put this eight inch onto a 30, it's gonna have that tackling effect. This setup is, is my minimum setup on every type of job that we would set this crane up on. Okay, how does this look? All right, so it's crazy because in truth, this is, this, is this is a legit setup. So we do, we have to get these cranes level. Okay, and the rule is when it comes to how high we can go in terms of how high we can crib up, the rule is you're gonna go, whatever the width is, you, you're gonna go no higher than one and a half times your width. 
then you don't get the Jenga effect, OK? So you're still applying the force uniformly because of the ratio? Yes. Now, if you want. Okay. See pictures of you doing. I'm about to give you some. So it's funny. So I'm in. So it's funny because in this is normal for us in tree care, right? Because we're all over the place. But if you post this in some, there's like a couple big crane Facebook groups. They'll they'll try and rip into you. They'll try a new one. What are you doing? But this is this is this is accurate. All right. But you don't want to you don't want to go any higher than this. This is the max height you would go on this before you'd have to go wider. Okay. All right, and again, making sure that we have, you know, if we need to get into a, a, you know, a delicate yard, that we have enough support and mats and materials to get in there. Um, I got a question on that one right there. Yes, sir. Setting up my house with a basement. The the so when it comes to setting up with, de with the house with a basement, it's going to be one to one ratio. Whatever the depth is, is going to be your your distance away. So if it's an eight foot basement, you want to set up eight feet away. If you need to get closer than that, then you have to really expand your outrigger footprint, all right? Your Making your pads bigger or trying to set up on the corner, okay? Because the way that force works is force comes directly down and there's forces that still come out all the way, but they reduce, okay? So that's why the further away, the less force on a 45 degree angle okay. is reduced. Corner, but you're pushing, down, you're, the you're pushing down the stretch of it. So if you do have to get close, try and put that near the corner. OK, but again, I'm very cautious about working near houses because, again, we had an incident back in 2019, the day after Christmas, a crane flipped over in Jersey because of an underground void from a, a faulty irrigation system that washed, washed a hole out in the bushes in that area underneath the ground. That's going to be my follow-up question is if you set up, like, next, you got gutter come out by then, do you avoid those areas? Yes, well? yes, because there could be issues underground. OK, you could, there's, there's, um, it starts with asking questions. Do you have an irrigation system? When was the last time it was serviced? You know, no, no, no. Then we're good. You know, you also do. You can also do soil density testing, which costs money. But listen, if you got bougie customers, they'll pay for that. You know, it all, it's all about who you're working with. They want the. They want the. They want the Ritz Carlton. You'll bring the Ritz Carlton, but they got to pay. Okay. Yeah. What? Yeah, soil density testing. Yeah, you could do that. I don't carry probrods on the curve. Do I? Yep. You can, yeah, I don't. Um, here's an example of just some like cribbing and stuff that you want to have with you to kind of get yourself get yourself situated. These are these are curb hoppers. We also use these to shim the tires because with knuckle booms, you always want to make sure your tires are, are being supported on the ground because our suspension is part of our stability factor. We don't lift them up like a stick crane. We have to we rely on our tires to make sure that our crane is stable. Once they come off the ground, that's when you start to see lift. Okay, if your if your suspension is not properly set up, your non-working side will start taking air. You'll start to see your outriggers, your stabilizers come up off the ground. If they go beyond eight inches, that's when you're going to have problems. Sometimes they do come up naturally, but if they're going beyond that, you're going to have issues when it comes to stability. All right, this is a this is a really extreme case that you would do something like this. Okay. This purpose built. I w so put it this way: for me, I would have rented another crane, for the price that it probably cost to build that in the time. Um, that would this was extreme um, for me, but it, it, but to just to prove the point that you have to have support in getting these machines level. Take the time and do it right. All right, but who's putting this? Who's stacking all these up? It's the ground guys, <laughs> right? It's the lag bolts. It's not the it's not the crane operator's gonna. He's going to sit in that truck with the freaking AC on and say, all right, get this shit together, right? All right, so you guys need to know. You guys need to know how to, how to do this stuff. And also, one thing I want to mention is that when it comes to, listen, when it comes to leveling, you're never going to go higher than two levels of cribbing in the same direction, all right? So you're not going to go four blocks up in the same direction. You're going to crisscross all the way up. But you can, the last t tier, if you've got to get a little more height, you can th they can still go in the same direction, but you're not going to go l more than two stacks high. OK? You guys got that? Anything over that's going to cause you to. It's going to get you that, or the Jenga effect, same thing. OK? Pressure won't be uniformly applied, and you can slip a few of them out. Yeah, it's so just. Is that just at the top, then? The two I, usually, that's. That, you, you want to use that as 
Do that at the bottom or in the middle? If, if, you, if you, no, I always do it at the top. It's like the one of the last things. I need to get a little more higher. Let me just throw one more on top of the last one. Otherwise, if you have the, if you have the material, just keep going the same way. Like I said, that's just, uh, you know, some guys will do that. They'll, they'll throw three. And I'm like, eh, it's not good, man. Like, that could, could potentially. The issue is, is, is that as we're working, if for whatever reason we're, we take lift and those tires come off, they could slide stuff out. So we want to make sure that we don't have any issues with toppling um, because when it comes back down, we want to make sure we're making contact with that surface. We don't want to give it any reason to collapse on itself, and we're not paying attention. What's your thought on the treatment number? Um, you're not supposed to use it, but I do. Why? It's because they want you using hardwoods. They want, they want you using materials that are stronger, but I've been using laminated beams my whole life. I mean, that's just what we did when we were, when I've always used, I've never had an issue with them. But it has to be four inches or thicker. I, I use uh, four by four, six by six, pressure treated. Oh, pressure treated or laminated? Were you pressure treated. Oh, yeah, pressure treated is fine. As long as it's, it's hardwood, yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about laminated. What would, what would be pressure treated hardwood? Like, 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 the, like railroad ties for landscape, like stuff that doesn't rot, you know? The wood that doesn't rot? No. I mean, no. It's all fine. It's they don't even know what that is. Come from China. No. <laughs> all right, how about this? Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, he's only picking up the bag. What? This is how this is this is how they roll in South America, okay? Um, so again, I give them I give them credit for making all their cribbing level, right? So they got a nice shim here, all right? So everything's straight, but again, we don't want to go. We never want to go in the same direction more than two levels high. So even on a stack like that in Hawaii, you just use one row. But even if you got just one row, you still want to go. You're not, well, you're not going to have, you're, no, you're not going to be able to do it unless it's like big blocks, you know, like big wide blocks. This is, yeah, this is not acceptable. I, you know, depending on the size, like you could do, you could do something, but you, you really want to have a good surface so that things move. It's always making contact back in the same spot. Well, in the picture of the one you had, you had them four by six or no, the LVLs. Yeah. Could you do those one row or you still want to double them up side by side? Um, no, you would still want to go. You, you would still want to go crisscross. Yeah. The other thing about that picture: knuckle boom tires off the ground. Correct. Knuckle boom tires off the knuckle boom tires off the ground. Um, the other thing, the other thing you want to the other the other thing is you got to be careful. So with knuckle booms, it is acceptable to short jack the machine. They're designed for for short jacking. Whereas a stick crane, you're not going to do that. Um, it's gonna it's gonna reduce your charts. What's up? <laughs> All right. Um, this is just lazy to me. Like I just like it's so heated when I see stuff like this. They're just throwing shit on the ground and trying to get it. It's just they, what they do is they'll throw stuff on the ground and push it in. Say, oh, it's gonna stop sinking eventually. But you're working over that. You're pushing it every time you swing. You're pushing it deeper into the ground. Pushing it deeper into the ground. Um, so again, making sure that it's set up properly. And like, look, this is like, ah, it's just bad practice. Okay. Yes, sir. Is that acceptable in the back with the deep frame to have it more, you know, not level? Um, no, you always want them level. Okay. Yeah. You always want them level, and you want these tires up off the ground. They look like they're a little bit off the ground, but it's hard to say. What do you mean by short that? So with a truck like this, you have to be able to set your outriggers up fully extended all the time. You can't, you can't say, all right, I'm going to go out on one side and not go out on the other. Um, certain stick cranes, you have your mid pin or your fully extended. Um, you're not supposed to run your, if you're running mid pin on your non-working side, you're going to run mid pin chart on your fully extended side. Because again, with stick cranes, if you were to over swing, you don't want to flip over. So we're always going to go with the lowest. Um, and knuckle booms, they won't, the newer ones won't even let you go over center if you're not fully extended on both sides. All right. So that's this stability, stability, stabilizer positioning. It'll tell you what your percentages are. And with the knuckle booms, they will actually, if you're not, if you're not fully extended, they'll actually derate your chart. It'll tell you, it'll, your percentages will go up a lot faster, a lot quicker if you're not fully extended. All right, center of gravity. Okay, so this isn't something, 
This isn't something that's really heavily focused on ground guys, but I like to talk about center gravity because guess where the ground guy is when the piece comes down? They're right there, right? That piece is coming down, and now what about when we bring those, take that, we take all the way up the slings. Sometimes pieces want to roll, right? We got to get out of there. We got to make sure that we understand that there's a balance point. And sometimes as we're manipulating stuff, things are going to shift. And we don't want our feet in the way. We don't want to be touching stuff. Um, ground guys like to touch and grab and twist. You just got to make sure that all the time, you got to make sure that you stay away. We don't, for whatever reason, if those slings were to fail, we don't want to get crushed underneath a piece of material. All right, so center gravity is a big, a huge thing. All right, and look, who, whose job is it to figure out where to put the slings? No, it's the ground guy. All right, where's the balance point? And you're like, it's this way, it's that way. All right, and even, you know, even me, when I used to run my crane, I used to always hop down and take a look before we made picks. That's why I don't like swing cabs. Because swing, swing cabs, like, if you're in the wrong position, you're not getting out. Okay? Pedestal cranes, I would have my ground guys build me a staircase to get up into my, into my pedestal. I'm like, all right, they're like, how many timbers do we need? I'm like, all of them. <laughs> Just throw them all on the ground, and they build me a little staircase, because we'd be six feet up in the air, and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to walk down. And I'd be, I would look every pick. I'm like, all right, because you, when you're the climber, man, you don't, you don't know. So you're so close to it, you can't see where everything's, where the center is. A lot of time, the ground guy's the one that's like, you know, move the crane tip over here, move it over there. But for me, I always look myself. But this is something that you could experience as a ground worker. That's what I did. I never asked my ground guys where a balance point is. I'll ask my climber, or I'll judge myself. Yeah. Never. I give them the opportunity to look and see where they are. I'm the operator. I'm going yeah. to decide where I think about things. Yeah. So. I'm typically the one hanging, and I've never, yeah, I'm going with you. I'm talking to you. Hey, does that look good from where you're at, sir? Is that, is that solid? Yeah. So, um, so I, don't, I don't teach just tree guys. I teach lifting in general. So I work in other industries as well. And I go, you guys have it so easy. You're picking up air conditioners. You're picking up pallets of shingles. You're picking up trusses, right? Like we're, 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 we're picking up unknown weights and unique shapes, okay? Every piece is unique, right? So that's where center gravity is so important because you have to understand that if the slings aren't in the right place, we're gonna have issues with force. And we'll talk about that a little bit later with movement. So we have to, we have to understand is that, we, that there's three potential axes that are gonna shift. We have an X, a Y, and a Z axis. All right, so X and Y are your forward and sideways. Your, your Z is gonna be rotation, okay? So, and it's a combination of all three is when stuff twists and flips over, you know? So as a climber, you have to say, all right, well, I really wanna put the slings here, but they really should go up here because we don't want this pick to be too big, but they're down here, now we need more butt weight. So now it's a, it's a matter of how small are we going to tie off to without wor with, with worrying about structure and branches snapping out compared to how much capacity do we need to have to make this lift or landing the load? Or should we just take it in three pieces, which is slower, slows down production, okay? So it's all, it's all those decisions, but that comes with balancing and making sure that things don't move. We want, every pick, um, we, want it to move, we want it to float away, right? We want to make that cut, all right? Crane operator, let's go, bring it away. And it just, there's nothing better. No better feeling in the world, okay? All right. Um, so some of this stuff, this is just general knowledge stuff, boom length, understanding how far we can reach with our radius and how much boom is required for that. With knuckle booms, we can, we can make lifts at horizontal picks um, and then work our way up. Um, a lot of times um, we use stuff to, to measure off where we're going to be setting up. Um, we use range finders to figure out how far away we're making our picks from and at that point what our crane's good for. And then we got to figure out how much we're potentially picking up. There's calculations for that too. That's a whole other class I have to teach you. I uh, calculate wood weight. So, so do you use a range finder? Oh, yeah. Do you? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm yep. going to bring Steve to you. I'm going to get my range finder. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you know who's really good at guy? I'll, and literally, the, well, this one, this one will measure your radius, how tall the tree is, and how much boom you need. It gives you three measurements. Yep. So it gives you the full triangle. 
So I know how much boom I'm going to have out, how tall the tree is for that, or how long the pick is going to be, and then how far away we're working from. You stand on the deck ball. Oh, yeah, we're good. We literally, literally we, did a, we did a training um, back in October where we literally were, if we were an inch back, we wouldn't have been able to take the tree down. We took the whole tree down from this one spot, and we used the range finder. We're like, up oh, 92.3. Uh, feet away, and just right. we just made it. We just made it. It was a freaking awesome project. All right. So again, it's going to give you your height mode, your actual distance, and your horizontal distance. Um, one of the other things that I really like to do is I like to have a little load chart. So on my knuckle boom, uh, I mean on my remote control, um, you, could, you could have a little chart that gives you what your, what your capacities are in those configurations. Otherwise, on the remote itself, it doesn't tell you what you're good for. It actually tells you what percentage to overload you are. You're at 88% to overload, 90% to overload. So this will actually tell you exactly what the weights are good for in those positions. And the way you're explaining that is your 88% to your overload and your 12% from being maxed out. Yeah. 90 or 10% from mm -hmm. maxed out. That's how that percentage works on that remote. Correct. I've only ever used my traditional cranes. Why does a knuckle boom crane not have the ability to tell you what you're good for or where you're sitting? Um, I don't know. I don't. We've been asking about it for years, you know. It's that's all OEM manufacturer stuff. Yeah. What you can Yeah, the only thing you can do the only um, it has to do with the fact that you have the articulating knuckle. So depending on the position of the knuckle will change your capacity sometimes. Most of the time it's so if you didn't have a if you didn't have a jib, so the piece that moves. It's based off your capacity is based off of how many sections you're using, okay? So when we teach knuckle boom operators, people, you know, they're always like, oh, well, I'll use the jib, you know? And I'm like, no, no, no. You're using full stick on your, main, on your main first, and then you want to have that jib as short as possible because the shorter the jib, the more capacity you have. If you're using short boom all jib, you're much weaker in, in reaching the same distance. Okay, so it's a combination. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's physics behind that, and I, I don't know why they haven't had that, but what we do is we will put, um, don't you have one? You have a, a load cell, right? Yeah. You, you put a load cell on your knuckle boom and uh, you can actually get real readouts of how much you're picking and compare them to your charts, okay? So the knuckle's the weak, weakest part when you're picking with? The jib is. The jib, I'm sorry. Yep, the jib is your weakest element of the lift. Yep, because now the main boom is not only lifting the jib, but the weight of the, the material. And it's all connected with pins. And anything that's pinned is going to be weaker than something that's solid. All right. So a little example of this big pick we did a couple years ago. Dynamic force. So dynamic force is anytime you 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 add um, a. <laughs> we could do that someday. Soft target. Um, <laughs> So anytime, anytime uh, dynamic force is anytime you, you implement a certain amount of energy in a quick fashion. Quicker, sudden movements are going to change the effective weight of the lift. Okay. So as a ground guy, you know we don't we want to be able to see our operators running you know efficiently, smooth and you know smoothly. Um, we don't want to see rapid jerking movements. You know some guys will run the you no know, matter, matter what type of crane, whether it's a knuckle boom or a stick crane, you don't want to see guys going like this hitting levers real quick. They're like, oh, I got to move it an inch. They jab at it. You want to you ease into movements because every time we move the crane, it changes the effective weight of the lift, all right? So if this was my log and this weighs 1,000 pounds, if I were to swing it really fast, the crane may feel like it weighs 5,000 pounds, even though nothing's changed besides the fact that it's moving really quickly. All right, climbers in here, you guys have ever done negative rigging? Oh, yeah. Okay. We're, 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 we're managing dynamic force. As that we make that piece and that piece comes around, as soon as it breaks off, it's pulling the tree in a certain direction. It's magnifying that force. Even though that, that limb weighs 500 pounds for a split second, it might feel like it weighs 5,000 pounds. We were getting like the smoothest run of the day, which was 460 pounds, generated 1,600 pounds. That was the best. Some yep. of the worst bombers did like 2,900 pounds of force. And, we, and that's when we start to see rigging failing and ropes failing in the trees. Same thing with cranes. Your slings will start snapping if you move stuff too quickly or dropping. So like with that knuckle boom, what we had was we had a load about three, 400 pounds in the hook. And when under, under load, all right, that crane's flexing. If you drop it, all of a sudden it's going to 
jump up in the air like a fishing pole. And by doing that, we're releasing energy too quickly into the system. And that's when we start to see uh, stuff, uh, equipment start to get damaged. All right, so again, deflection. You know, this is before we made the pick. You can see that the crane is up here, and then after we made the pick, it sagged down. All right, so making sure that we're preparing for that, we pre-tension stuff when we make picks. Um, one of the biggest reasons I think that there's a lot of crane failures, not only because of stability reasons on the ground, is because guys will say, all right, I'm good for 2,500 pounds. I'm gonna take this top, it weighs 2,400 pounds. Okay? And then the wind blows. They, they, they sling it up, but they don't pre-tension, okay? They just get it a little bit tight, but they don't pre-tension to, the to the proper weight. So if I was picking up 2,400 pounds, okay, I would pre-tension my boom to 1,800 pounds, which is 75% of my predicted weight. That way, my crane is already deflected. Once you make that cut, it's gonna sit there. If you don't pre-tension, what's gonna happen is you're gonna add that deflection into the boom, which makes your load go further away. When your load goes further away, what happens to your capacity? It goes down. And that's when you see tops pulling cranes over. All right? And that's what happens all the time. Guaranteed. They didn't do pretension properly. It went from a 30-foot radius to a 38-foot radius. And that 38 feet was only good for 1,200 pounds. And you had 24 on the hook. All right? All right? Um, so again, as a ground guy, you guys should be familiar with looking at these low charts, you know? Next time you're walking past the crane and this is stuff that's right on the side of the truck and you're setting it up, take a look at these charts and say, all right, you know, at this position, what am I good for? Oh, I'm good for 20,000 pounds. This is all stuff that you guys should just have a basic understanding of. I'm not saying you gotta crunch all the math, but understand that, hey, if we're running three sections of boom, we're good for 20,000 pounds, all right? Um, this, is my, this is my low chart on my truck. Okay, so with knuckle booms or anything that has a jib, you know, you do have to take into consideration that the angle of the boom um, will determine how much you change your capacity. If I didn't have a jib on here, I would, have a, I would have a little chart like this that would literally give me how much it would be per section, just like this. But with a knuckle boom with a jib, um, the lower we go, it does change the capacity a little bit. Okay, they're relatively the same but knowing that, hey, if I'm working at a 45 degree angle or higher, I'm gonna use this chart. If I'm working anywhere in between here, I'm gonna use the numbers here. You're always gonna use the next lower chart to cover your butt. All right, and again, it all depends on how much jib you're using. So if I'm fully retracted, I'm using all my main boom, I'm good for 30 to 80, and I'm good to reach 60 feet away. It's a pretty good number, right? Pick up 30, 3,200 pounds flat out, it's pretty cool. All right, um, and that's it. I'm gonna end it four minutes early. All right. Thank you, Mom. So thank you guys for coming, and like I said, thank you for coming to Arbor Fest. Uh, Six o'clock tonight.